Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Cindy. My name is Beth Kitchen, and um, I'm an assistant professor in the UAB Department of Nutrition Sciences, where I'm the director of media and community engagement. I also teach a lot of classes. I teach some undergrad classes, and I also teach some graduate courses. And then the other thing that I do, and this is where my clinical sort of area of interest and expertise is, is that I'm the patient educator in the UAB osteoporosis clinic. And so what you'll find is a lot of times when I use examples, I'm using, you know, sort of examples from bone health and osteoporosis. Uh, but that's kind of where my clinical work is. And I really love being involved in the clinic over there. Although I haven't been in clinic since March, you know, because of the pandemic. Now, this is a talk that I actually put together for a group, a patient group at UAB, and I kind of modified it for these times. And it's sort of talking about eating for immunity and for anti-inflammation. And, you know, talking about nutrition is, is a little bit challenging because you know, we at UAB, and I'm very um, dedicated to evidence-based nutrition. And so a lot of times what you'll hear me say is, well, the evidence is, you know, kind of marginal there, but this is what we think is happening. And so I always touch on, you know, where the research actually is. Um, and a lot of times the messaging and the media are way far ahead of where the actual evidence is. And I welcome questions on anything as we go along. So, and I'll probably be taking my glasses on and off because as I'm getting older, i I need my I need my readers sometimes and sometimes not. So so let's get started. And so as I said, I started this um, this talk because I had a lot of questions about you know inflammation and how is that related to disease. And this is an area that's relatively new. And as anyone who is involved in research knows, research is slow. I think we've seen that a lot with um, coronavirus and the pandemic, you know, people want answers. Well, you know, the research takes time. And it's the same thing in nutrition and particularly things like eating uh, food in relationship to lowering inflammation. So we've all heard of inflammation being a problem. And this is not the kind of inflammation that you see. You know, it's not like when you, um, when you have, I, I just had some dental surgery. It's not like when you have dental surgery and you are swollen or you, you know, sprain your wrist or your ankle and you see that inflammation. This is this really low level of inflammation in various tissues and organs in the body that you, body that you don't notice. You don't feel it. You don't see it. But this sort of subtle chronic inflammation is associated with a host of diseases. Now notice I use the word associated with because we're really not sure about the relationship there, but there seems to be some sort of relationship with things like certain cancers, um, heart disease, diabetes, particularly the complications of diabetes, joint diseases, possibly bone diseases like osteoporosis and other uh, types of diseases and disorders as well. As I said, the nature of the relationship we know a lot less about, maybe more in some certain areas where the research is more advanced. So again, there's a lot that we don't know. And as many of you know, the more we find out, the more we realize we don't know. One of the things that I find in nutrition is that there's a lot of research out there. If you pay attention to headlines and, and uh, websites, you see a lot of nutrition research out there. Some is better than others. Uh, some is good research, but we have to be very careful what we can say about it. And one of the things that we see with a lot of nutrition studies is that they are the kinds of studies that show associations, that show correlation. These two things might be related. So eating a certain type of diet may reduce inflammation. And again, these are often associations. Do we know that there's a causal relationship? Do we know that if I eat these types of foods, there's a pretty good chance that it will 
help me to live longer, reduce my risk of this specific disease. And that's what we don't know. And um, as one of my ex-students pointed out, I've been do doing this. Yeah, I taught you your freshman year. That was a long time ago. I've been doing this a long time. And one of the things that I have learned with being around a long time is that so many times, these associations don't really prove in the end to be as strong as we thought or causal like we thought. I don't know if any of you remember when we used to recommend vitamin E for preventing heart disease. There were these association studies that showed that it was related to a lower risk of heart disease. And there was a mechanism even involved. There was a biological mechanism that kind of made sense. But when those studies got further along and better studies happened, we found that there really was no direct um, cause between taking vitamin E supplements and lowering the risk of heart disease, and that there were actually some dangers with high, dose of high doses of vitamin E. So we've got to be really careful. But we all, you know, we all want to be able to eat foods that are going to help us be healthier. The other problem that we see, besides that a lot of the studies that we see early on are the only show, again, associations, a lot of times what we study, we're studying what we call markers of diseases as opposed to true outcomes. And this is not necessarily a bad thing. You have probably all seen studies on heart disease where the researchers looked at things like HDLs, LDLs, cholesterol in the blood. Did it lower those? That's not a bad thing. And that's very interesting. And it, if you find that something lowers cholesterol, you know, that's, that might be a good thing. But the problem with that is, is it the outcome that we really care about the most? I told you that I use a lot of osteoporosis, uh, stories, analogies, because that's my area of expertise. In osteoporosis, you know, there might be medicines or supplements that um, increase the bone density, for instance, or decrease markers of bone loss. And so we look at that and we go, oh, wow, that might be beneficial. But what do we really care about in osteoporosis? Well, we care about, does it lower your chances of breaking a bone? That's what really matters. And so, for instance, an osteoporosis medicine is probably not going to be approved by the FDA just on bone density data. We want to know, did it lower fracture risk? A really good example of that is many, many years ago, some researchers started experimenting with giving people fluoride supplements. And the early on uh, data was really exciting. We saw bone density really shooting up. So we got really excited about that, like, oh my gosh, Maybe we could just have people take fluoride supplements and it'll help treat osteoporosis. But the problem was the fracture study showed absolutely no effect on lowering the chances of breaking a bone. So there's really no good reason to take a supplement unless you get that outcome that you're really looking for or a medicine if you get that outcome that you want. Now, I, I always stress to people there's nothing wrong studying these intermediate measures. There's nothing wrong with sometimes even recommending things based on these intermediate measures. The idea is that we have to be very clear with what did the study show as the actual outcome. I see this a lot in obesity um, where people are studying uh, weight control and they'll say, well, oh, you know, this study showed that maybe um, doing this, like taking this particular supplement, decreased hunger. And that's exciting. But did it end up actually with lower body weight, helping people actually lose weight? Those are two different things. So we always have to be very clear with what is the research actually showing? Uh, so I just, I, I, I always touch on these, especially in some things like inflammation, immunity, because the data is here but the hype and the promises are often up here. When you look at things like books on immunity, eating for immunity, anti-inflammation diets, you know, a lot of people are out there kind of making some money off of stuff that doesn't really necessarily have a strong evidence base. I don't have any problem with people writing books about this, but a lot of times the promises that they make, uh, the things that they tell you to do may not be based in 
uh, the best data. Um, and that's particularly true um, when you see supplements being sold um, for things like, again, um, immunity and also um, inflammation. Um, so these, these, are, these are problems. Um, so let's, um, yeah, I see somebody saying they're dealing with inflammation <laughs> right now. Yeah, probably a lot of us are. <laughs> probably a lot of us are. So let's look at, oh, let me go back here. So let's look at some, some good information that I feel like is, is, is good information to give to people for eating for anti-inflammation. And it also ties in with immunity because immunity and inflammation are sort of tied together. So um, we can look at two kind of eating patterns. These are two eating patterns that I think both are very good. They're both plant-based. They're not vegetarian necessarily, but they are plant-based. And I think that they are some pretty good eating patterns that have some, some pretty decent data behind them. Um, I look at eating patterns. A lot of people will email me, ask me questions, say, is this a good food to eat? Is this a healthy food or is this a bad food? That's a tough question to answer because there is no single food that's going to save you. There is no single food that's going to kill you. It's all about eating patterns. I look at my own eating pattern. I probably eat a little bit more added sugar than I should, uh, but the rest of my diet is, is pretty healthy. I feel like I can handle that extra sugar. I'm not too worried about that one component because overall, you know, I think my diet's in pretty decent shape. Um, as a, uh, my, um, uh, my Twitter handle is bad dietitian because when I compare myself to other dietitians, when I see what they're doing, um, I feel uh, like I'm probably on the lower end. I, I was watching um, a video of uh, a bunch of nutrition professionals at a conference and they interviewed them on what they ate. Every single one ate oatmeal for breakfast. And I'm like, oh, I really don't like oatmeal. I'm not going to eat oatmeal, but it's like everybody, you know, they're steel cut oatmeal every morning. My boyfriend does that. I think it's great, but it's not for me. So I sometimes feel like I'm not, uh, I'm not hitting it uh, the, uh, with a, compared to other dietitians. But let's look at these eating patterns and what they have in common. The DASH diet, if any of you are familiar with the DASH diet, that stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And this is one of the, um, <laughs> I see somebody said oatmeal is pretty good when you had, you had peanut butter. <laughs> yeah, probably chocolate chips too, right? Um, I think oatmeal, you know, I like it. I just, oh, it's, it's, so, it's so heavy in the morning. I can't take it. Um, so the DASH diet actually has some very good research surrounding it. It actually started out as a research study, and it has been shown to actually lower blood pressure. Uh, so it's a really, really healthy diet. What do these two diets have in common, Mediterranean and DASH? Well, they're high in fiber. They're high in omega-3 fats. They're very high in fruits and vegetables. They've got some low GI carbs. Now, what do I mean by low GI carbs? GI stands for glycemic index. Think of that as whole grain. So the, the, the whole wheat bread, the brown rice, and we're going to talk about how to work those into your diet. And then also things like nuts and seeds. Now, the Mediterranean diet, for those of you that like some wine, you know, there's some wine on that diet. A lot of people like that part of it. Other people don't care, and that's fine. But these are both really healthy diets. Uh, Mediterranean is higher in overall fat, heavier on the plant fats, particularly olive oil. Um, and so they, there are some differences. And I think one of the reasons that some people – feel more satisfied on something like the Mediterranean diet is that it, it feels kind of richer because of that high fat content. It can be very tasty and very satisfying. Um, so that you have to kind of choose the diets that you kind of uh, gravitate towards and that make you feel happy. I think that's important. Now, these diets, a lot of people say to me, well, Beth, yeah, these are great diets, but it means more cooking. Um, Things like berries, you know, we talk about things like blueberries being very rich in antioxidants. They can be very expensive. So one of the things that I always talk to people about, what I call food hacks, you know, what are the ways that we can hack into these sort of easy ways 
maybe less expensive ways of achieving a healthier diet. Salmon, if you go to the go to the market and buy fresh salmon, that can be very expensive. The packaged salmon, a little bit lower in omega-3s, but not much. You can still get a, a lot of those omega-3 fatty acids by making, say, a salmon salad or adding, um, making salmon cakes or something with your, with the packaged salmon. Uh, brown rice is very cheap to cook from scratch, but, you know, it can also take a long time. I have found some of these rice uh, things that you just put in the microwave really convenient. Now, they're a little bit more expensive, but if you're going for convenience, I love quinoa. I'm terrible at cooking it. So I always get these blends because when I cook quinoa, it doesn't taste very good. But these things taste great. And again, you can get frozen berries, which are very healthy for you. The packaged salads. Again, some of these things are more expensive than the fresh. Some are less expensive. I love these matchstick carrots. They're really easy to throw in stir fries, in salads. And again, carrots are um, have a lot of beta carotene, a lot of fiber. So finding convenient things, if you're looking for convenience, finding lower cost ways. Those are two of the issues that I see are really big for people. And I like to always throw these questions out to the audience because I know what works for me. But um, not everybody's in the same situation as I am. And so I find that when people start sharing their ways of making these diets work, it's, it's really fun. And I learn a lot from hearing what other people are doing. Um, so let's talk, I'm going to touch a little bit on weight. Cindy, you were talking about your, um, your group doing um, a little weight intervention. How does weight fit into all of this? So, you know, there may be certain eating patterns that can help us with immunity and with um, anti-inflammation uh, anti uh, goals there. Where does weight fit in? And weight is very interesting because it can kind of go two ways. Underweight is bad. Overweight can also be bad. And so the goal is to be at a healthy your way. I'm a big believer that you don't have to get down to an ideal body weight to be healthy. Um, I, I have seen so many people who probably by the textbook definition were overweight, maybe even in the low category of technically obese, but they could get up those stairs pretty quickly and without being out of breath. They're going out for walks. Uh, they're, they feel good. Their blood pressure is not high. They don't have high cholesterol. Now, the weight still probably puts them in a little bit of a higher risk category, but they're still, you know, pretty metabolically healthy. So, uh, you know, I like to look at metabolic health, other parameters of health. Are you doing the things that you want to do? If your weight is keeping you from doing things that you want to do, then yeah, let's talk about it and work on it. If it's keeping you from achieving a health goal, then yeah, let's talk about it. Um, but I, I worked early on in my career in weight loss programs, and it's a losing weight and keeping it off really, really hard for, for some people. Some people it's easier, but other people it's very hard. And so I like to sort of focus on those other outcomes that I think are really important. But look on the left side here. If you are malnourished, if you are underweight, um, you may actually be immunosuppressed as well, and you can actually be at increased risk of infection. But look on the right side. Um, you can also be, uh, with overweight, have more inflammation uh, because of immunoactivation. And so we, we really like to look at this as being at a healthier weight, uh, as opposed to being at some textbook perfect weight. But uh, I'll tell you, in, in my clinic where I work, I have a lot of patients who are underweight. And it can be just as hard to help people to get to a healthy, get up to a healthy weight, as it is to get down to a healthy weight. Um, it, it can be quite a struggle. One of the things I like to focus on with weight, I, I love this study. I love this study because it showed that sometimes making one change can help you with weight loss. And this is a really neat study where they randomized people 
to an American Heart Association diet. So this was an overall diet and designed to help people lose weight, so a weight loss diet. The other group, they said, the only thing we want you guys to change is to get 30 grams of fiber into your diet every day. So they showed them how to get a higher amount of fiber. Now, the folks on the weight loss diet over a year's period did lose more weight but I really love the high fiber group. So even though they didn't lose quite as much weight as the other group, they lost a little bit over, on average, remember we always look at averages, they lost a little bit over four and a half pounds over a year's time just by making this one change. And maybe some other things changed in their diets too as a product of this, but I, I thought this was very exciting because it's like, wow, I can talk to patients and consumers about, let's start with really upping your fiber and see if that helps. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, four and a half pounds over a year, that's really not that much. But when you think about it for a lot of people, they're not just staying the same over that year. A lot of people, their weight's creeping up a little bit every year. And so when you kind of add that into the, the possibility, I, I look at that and go, I think that's pretty good. And so that's a great place to start. So if any of you are struggling with weight loss and you're getting tired of dieting and that's really stressful, you know, it might be nice just to kind of drill down and focus on, well, I've got to start adding in some fiber and, and see what that looks like. Now, one of my friends, I was talking to him about this diet and he said, or this, this, this study, and he said, Beth, I don't even know what fiber is. I don't know what foods are high in fiber. <laughs> and so I said, well, let, let's talk about that. Um, and so the fiber, fiber foods are, are higher in plant-based diets. So uh, fruits and vegetables are higher in fiber. But notice, if you're shooting for 30 grams of fiber a day, that's not necessarily easy. Because look at the amount of fiber in these foods. You know, an apple is 4 grams, a banana is 3, a whole cup of cooked broccoli is 5. So you got to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables to up your fiber. So work on reading your labels um, and really work on that, that message from many, many years ago when I was a young dietitian, we used to have that five a day campaign, getting five servings of fruits and vegetables can get you on your way. The other place where you can add a lot of fiber, you know, oatmeal, as much as I don't like to eat oatmeal in the morning, that's a great place to get fiber. So whole grain cereals. Now, Notice here I say switch to whole grain where you can. Um, not every single grain you eat has to be a whole grain. Look at the ones where you feel that it's going to work for you. I personally love brown rice. I think brown rice tastes better than white rice. Whole wheat pasta, on the other hand, no way for me. I do not like whole wheat pasta and I'm not going to eat it. So when I eat pasta, which I do probably two or three times a week, I just get regular. So whole wheat bread I love. So look at the places that it's going, where it, it tastes good to you. I think it's really important to like what you eat. Um, so give some of these things a try, but if you just don't like them, you know, find the ones that you do like. And this is where label reading really comes into being important is, Looking at the ingredients list. So when you're looking for breads that are whole wheat uh, or cereals, the first ingredient should say a whole grain. That does not mean it's 100% whole grain or whole wheat, but it tells you that it predominates, that at least half of the grains are, are whole grain. So look around for things that you like. A great way to add a lot of extra fiber in, and I should have gotten a prop from my kitchen is adding in a brand cereal. Those brand cereals, if you're eating like, um, you know, a regular cereal like cornflakes and you want to add some fiber, add some of that brand cereal in, man, you get a lot of bang for your buck with the, with the brand cereal. So add those in. So finding ways to really up the fiber content. Another great way, and we in the South, we love our starchy beans. This is another great way to add in um, to add in some fiber um, and also some other important nutrients. So nuts and seeds, and then also any of those starchy beans, pinto beans, black beans, white beans, um, northern beans, all of those beans are really great. And the type of fiber that's in the starchy beans, 
tends to uh, lower cholesterol and may play a role in improving heart health as well. So if you like these kinds of foods, you know, finding recipes that, again, taste really good. Um, whenever I make a bean rice dish, I like to make those. Well, you know what I add? I put shredded cheese on top. I'm a big cheese lover. And that's fine. It makes it really taste good to me. Not everybody needs to do that. But you know, cheese, if any of you know me personally, you know that cheese is probably my favorite food. Um, and so that really adds into the flavor for me. Plus it adds some calcium. Now, another part of this, I'm going to just check in on some things here. I usually eat oatmeal or raisin bran. Oh, good. This morning, Latoya, great. That's awesome. Yeah, raisin bran crunch. Yeah. So a lot of great ways. Cereal is a great quick and easy breakfast. Um, and you can really, that's a great place to add some fiber in. Added sugar. Let's talk about added sugar because um, this is a place where if you're eating a lot of added sugar, it could be affecting your weight. And again, kind of my same message here with the whole grains. You don't have to give up sugar. But if you're getting a lot of it, it is a great idea to try to, to, to reduce that. Luckily, the new labels make it so much easier to look for the added sugar. And again, added sugar, it tastes so good. I like some sweets every day. Um, I try to keep it, you know, at least as low as I can. Now, I, I look at these <laughs> when I when I test out my own sugar. I think I top out a, a little bit over the recommendations, but I, I, I don't think I'm quite as high as this. When you look at some research, it shows that um, the average American, this is the average, not everybody, is uh, the average American adult, um, or actually this is over age one, is eating 22 teaspoons of added sugars a day. That's the equivalent of 355 extra calories. Again, this is average. This may not be you. You may be more, you may be less. Look at teenagers. When they just drill down on teenagers, somebody was asking me about kids. Look at how much teenagers are eating. It's a lot of extra added sugar. Um, some, you know, some people can handle this extra sugar, but, but not everybody can. Um, the new food label came out at the beginning of this year, and one of my favorite things about the new food label is that it shows specifically added sugar. Before, some of you may have noticed this difference, before, if you looked at sugars, it just said sugars. Well, if you looked at something like 100% orange juice, you would see a lot of sugars in there, but the sugars were part of the orange juice. Now, that sugar that's a natural part of the orange juice isn't really any different biologically than added sugar, a little bit of biological difference, but not a whole lot. But the difference there is that something like 100% orange juice also has a lot of nutrients in it. So yeah, while you're getting a lot of sugar, it's just part of the natural food and you're still getting a lot of healthy benefits from it. Sort of contrast that with a soda where all you're getting is all that sugar. It's added not a whole lot of other benefits from that. And so you kind of have to, to, to look at that. There are some people that say, oh, you should never drink juice because of all those sugars. Well, I, I always tell people don't use juice as a thirst quencher, but it's actually a pretty good way of getting in some pretty important nutrients. I like to mix juice with mineral water. So I'm getting the benefits, but sort of um, stretching out, <laughs> stretching out the calories and the, and the sugar a little bit. So always look down at the added sugars. This is showing you the sugar that has been added. And that's not just the natural part of the food. And this is the sugar that we want to work on reducing. Because again, it's usually sort of those empty calories. Now, one of the things that's problematic is a lot of times they make recommendations based on you know, teaspoons of sugar. And one of the recommendations is that for women, we should not get any more than nine teaspoons of sugar. Well, it's not it's teaspoons. And uh, the way you can sort of remember this is every four grams of sugar is a teaspoon of sugar. You don't even have to remember that, though, because they have this nice little percentage sign next to it. And that's a pretty good overall recommendation that as you approach 100%, you're probably getting about where your limit should be. It's a ballpark figure. 
Um, if you go a little bit over that, is that necessarily bad? I don't think so. It just depends on, again, your overall eating pattern. But it's a pretty good marker. So this thing called the percent daily value, which is that percentage for sugars, you kind of want to say, you know, 100% or less. Again, for some of us, if you're going a little bit over, not necessarily a bad thing because it's a kind of one size fits all number. Here's another big recommendation that has nothing to do with food or nutrition, but it, you know, it's a total, total package here, exercise. There's some, there is some uh, data that shows that even just 20 minutes of exercise is associated with lower inflammation. And so we see consistently with data over the years that exercise always comes out on top as a top recommendation for all sorts of things, even mental and emotional health. I'm a big believer in exercise. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, there are a lot of challenges with exercise. And so if you can find ways to work activity in, that can be really helpful. Uh, there are a lot of great, um, you know, in times of the pandemic where a lot of us are at home, you know, getting outside for a walk can be very beneficial, not an option for everybody, depending on your situation. There are also a lot of really great YouTube videos. So finding ways of working in exercise. And again, a great message is that even just 20 minutes is great. I always recommend to my patients, if you're having a really hard time with exercise, try with five minutes of even just marching in place, five minutes, put some music on, five minutes every other day, start there and work up. Another thing that works really well with exercise is getting a friend to exercise with you either virtually or you know outside. And that can be also really useful for people. So again, our three keys, plant-based diet, weight control, and then physical activity. And so these are really the three keys. I want to add in, I'm looking at our time, we're pretty good here, so I think we're leaving time for questions. I want to talk a little bit more about immunity, particularly with the pandemic, with coronavirus. A lot of information out there. You know, when the pandemic hit, I saw all sorts of um, supplements being promoted, all sorts of things. The FTC, the Federal Trade Commission came down really hard and sent out a lot of letters telling companies to cease and desist because they were making unproved claims. But I want to talk about one of the supplements that is showing some promise. And I really stress some promise. And um, Think about immunity. You always hear people say you want to boost immunity. Well, you don't want immunity to go into an overactive phase either. An overactive immune system um, is, can be bad as well and cause a lot of symptoms and a lot of problems. You have to be very careful. We don't want to boost immunity. We want to keep our immunity. We want to keep our immune system healthy and maintain it. The immune system is not one thing. It's a very complex system. Um, even our, our gut health plays a role. Um, the acidity of our stomach plays a role in preventing certain microbes from g getting into our system. That acidity can really help. So even, even something as simple as the pH of our gut can play a role in preventing infection and disease. When we talk about nutrition, there are a lot of nutrients that play a role. But one of the things I want to really stress to you as you start to see headlines coming out about various nutrients is that more is not better. Uh, once you reach a level of having um, an adequate or an appropriate level of a nutrient, more is probably not going to be better and can actually be dangerous for a lot of nutrients. So always keep that in mind. And so the nutrient that I want to talk about that seems to be, again, showing some promise is vitamin D, the sunshine vitamin. And um, again, I really stress to people not overdoing vitamin D because it can be toxic. And we've had patients in our clinic, in our osteoporosis clinic, where we've tested their vitamin D levels and they're way too high and we take them off all their vitamin D supplements until those levels come back down to normal. There can be um, a lot of toxicity symptoms. 
Uh, one of the ones that I don't have on here is that it, there seems to be an associated increased risk of certain cancers with too much vitamin D. So it's pretty serious. So keeping those levels in the normal, healthy range. If you're already there, you just want to stay there. But what's the challenge with vitamin D? Vitamin D, uh, it's pretty easy to be deficient in it. The sun is the main way that we make vitamin D. If you're like me, I wear sunscreen anytime I go out, which lowers my vitamin D production. If you are African American or any other ethnicity where the melanin in your skin is, is greater, that acts as a natural sunscreen and it blocks vitamin D production. Uh, and then also as we age, simply getting older and our skin thins, we don't have as much of that little precursor chemical that gets converted to vitamin D. So you can see that while some people, particularly young people who are out active, maybe in the sun a lot, they may be making enough vitamin D. The rest of us, uh, not so much. And what about food sources? Well, we need to get, I'm, I'm going to say 800 to 1,000 IUs of vitamin D every day. It's a little bit higher than what some of the recommendations are, but a good place for you to kind of think about is about 800 to 1,000 IUs. We'll look at the food sources. It's kind of hard to get it from foods unless you love cod liver oil or you're eating baked salmon three times a day. So food sources, while there are some, it's kind of hard to get a whole lot from our food. So it's probably not a bad idea for many of us to get a little bit of a supplement of vitamin D. What should you look for? Again, don't overdo it. I don't let people go over 2,000 IUs a day from supplements um, unless under the guidance of a physician. We have some patients that are really deficient. And if you were one of my patients and you were deficient in vitamin D, I might recommend 5,000, 10,000 IUs a day until you get up to that level. And then I look at your lab, you're normal, then I back you back down to a maintenance dose. Because again, we want to be careful not to go up into those toxic levels. Uh, vitamin D is not a lab that we typically, uh, that's an, on any of the typical panels that we do in a standard way. So it's kind of to the doctor's discretion whether or not you've had a vitamin D level check. So if you haven't, what's a pretty good recommendation? Well, I tell people to look at all of the supplements that you're taking. If you're taking a calcium supplement, a multivitamin, a joint supplement, anything over the counter that you're taking, look at the label because a lot of things have vitamin D in it. And you may be hitting this 800 to 1,000 supplemental vitamin D level, and so you're most likely fine. What if you're not? What if you don't take a calcium supplement that has D? What if you don't take a multivitamin? You're not getting any much vitamin D. Then you can get an over-the-counter, plain old vitamin D supplement they have them in all different levels from 400 IUs up to 5,000 IUs. And so you can get the one that kind of suits your needs. They're tiny. Uh, they're very easy to take. I do recommend that you take them with food. Uh, but again, I really, really stress the not overdoing it part. And again, this is the one supplement where we are seeing some data. It's not... Um, necessarily causal, but they are seeing that people who have normal vitamin D levels are less likely to be uh, diagnosed with coronavirus. They're a little bit less likely to have to go on oxygen or go on a ventilator. These are association studies. Um, it doesn't mean that taking vitamin D is going to definitely protect you. It might give you a little bit of an edge. So I really kind of um, express this data to you with caution and moderation. It's not the end all be all, but it's a safe thing to do if you're you know, not overdoing it. And it's an inexpensive thing to do. And then there's also other benefits to vitamin D, supplements with bone health, et cetera. And it is one of the supplements, as I said, that uh, we tend to be a little deficient in. Hey, Beth, so, get too much yeah. Hey, let me just, there have been a couple questions. Um, sure, and, I'm, and that kind of concludes my slide. Oh. So, so that's a perfect timing on there. And in fact, I'm going to take these down so we can talk. So, um, so yeah, so um, 
let's 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 chat now with with questions. So the first the first question I saw um, it's up just a, a bit like at ten thirty nine. Um, and um, if, if you've been prescribed a lot of steroids over the years, does this cause a lot of issues with your immune system? Um, it, I, I don't know how it affects the immune system, but I can tell you that a lot of uh, the corticosteroids, things like prednisone, if you have been prescribed those, it can affect your bone health. So we know that there can be an effect on bone health. It may affect vitamin D levels and so there could be a link there um if there are any doctors in the house who can speak to the effect on immunity they actually are you know corticosteroids are very strong anti-inflammatory now what effect that would have on the immune system um could it suppress the immune system possibly depending on the amount that you're taking but we do know that there's a strong relationship between corticosteroids and osteoporosis. So I would recommend that anybody who's been on um, corticosteroids longer than three months, that you talk to your doctor about your bone health because there's a really strong relationship there. There's actually a diagnosis of corticosteroid-induced osteoporosis. So, mm -hmm. so definitely pay attention to that. Someone just texted me a question. Um, is um, the, the, It says, can you ask about inflammation in lupus patients and is there a correlation between food and lupus I you know that's a that's a wonderful question and I have not seen I have looked at some of those studies and I have not seen anything really strong there uh, the same thing with things like rheumatoid arthritis you know all of these um, sort of immuno related sort of diseases and what we do recommend is sort of what we talked about today, this overall diet of, you know, getting um, omega-3 fatty acids. I do recommend that if people can do it, eating fatty fish three times a week. Um, possibly taking some omega-3s. I would talk to your doctor about that. Some are better than others. When we get into talking about supplements, they're not regulated. That can be good. That can be bad. You don't know what you're getting sometimes. Um, so I do recommend for people with lupus, for people with rheumatoid arthritis, this, you know, sort of what we talked about today, the sort of anti-inflammation diet. Can I point you to any causal data on that? Unfortunately, no. But this is one of those things where it's at least a safe thing to do and could have possible benefits. But I do recommend things like, I, I think the fatty fish three times a week, things like salmon, sardines, um, can be very beneficial. And they're just near the bottom of the stream, Beth, there's several new questions. There. Yes, let me take a look at some of, uh, of these. Uh, taking a multivitamin, yeah, this is a really good question. Um, in full disclosure, I take a multivitamin. Uh, do I expect it to actually do anything great for me? No, I do not. <laughs> there are some things that we do um, that make us feel good. You know, there's this, there's this aspect of health that are sort of what I call the rituals that we do, the, the, the self-care rituals that make us feel good. And that's one of the reasons I take a multivitamin. I, I take a multivitamin where two tablets are a dose and I just take one tablet a day. So I'm actually getting a half dose because I just want that little extra insurance. Um, when you look at the data on multivitamins, they show that basically from the perspective of chronic diseases, uh, lowering the risk of diabetes, heart disease, certain cancers, that there's really no, no benefit. Does that mean that the end all be all study has been done, not necessarily. And this is one of those areas where I think if you're not, I don't want people spending a lot of money on a multivitamin. I don't want somebody telling you that, oh, if you take my very expensive multi pack multivitamin, these are all the great things that are going to happen to you because I can tell you that they probably don't have any evidence to support that. So I don't like people spending a lot of money on them. You can get really good quality supplements at 
the CVS brand, the Walmart brand, the Walgreens brand. And what you should always look at on a supplement are the letters USP. And USP stands for United States Pharmacopeia. Now, that does not guarantee you that it works, that there's evidence that it's beneficial to you. But what it does show you is that it's not contaminated with any um, impurities, anything dangerous, because that can sometimes happen. It also tells you that it has in it what it says it has in it. Again, over-the-counter supplements are not regulated, and there have been some evaluations of them that have shown that they don't have in them what they say they do. Either they have a lot more, or they have less to none of what they say. So that USP guarantees you, it's sort of a truth in advertising. And then the other thing that that USP tells you is that it dissolves in the gut. That's important, right? I mean, you can, you can take your multivitamin, but if it doesn't dissolve and just kind of goes out the other end, you're not getting the benefits of it. And so when you see that USP, it's kind of your good housekeeping seal of approval. Now, there are supplements out there that don't have USP on them and that are very good quality supplements. Um, they just don't have the USP come in and do the evaluation. So uh, one of the things that I subscribe to is the Consumer Lab. And Consumer Lab, if any of you are really into supplements and want a really good website to go to, it does cost you, but it's only about $40 a year. And they give you very good reviews of the evidence base for various supplements. And then they also have um, a table that shows you all the evaluations that they've done to show you quality supplements. And that's for any, a lot of different supplements, not just multivitamins, but for, you know, all sorts of herbal supplements and all kinds of things. So it's a great website to go to to get really good quality, unbiased information. Um, so that's another place that you can go. Um, I, I don't want to, I'm not plugging CVS. I don't have any stock or any um, financial interest in CVS, but they started a program where any CVS supplement that they sell has to have like a third party um, actually evaluate the supplement. So you can go into any CVS and get a supplement. And supposedly, if the program does what it says it does, their, their supplements have been tested for quality, content, and again, dissolution doesn't dissolve. Um, so my feelings on multivitamins are, is it going to help you? Maybe, maybe not. But if you take one that does not have mega doses, be careful not to go for these ones that have, you know, like 10,000% of the daily value. That's probably not going to help you and can be detrimental. So a good basic multivitamin, why not? Yeah. Big long answer to that question. Complicated question. <laughs> it is, it's, it, but it's a good, it's a really, really good question. Um, is fish oil an okay supplement if you hate seafood? Uh, that's from Alice. Yes, I, I think it is. Um, and I, I, I don't have any information on that right here, but that would be one, Alice, that would be a really good place to go to a website like Consumer Labs. To find information about that. You can get plant sources of omega-3 fatty acids, but the plant sources are not quite as potent as the fish oil. So I think fish oil supplements are okay, but you really want to be careful not to overdo it. So I would look for a good website to find some really good solid recommendations on that and talk to your doctor about it too. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, that's a good recommendation. Um, do you recommend a fiber supplement? Uh, I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm a nutritionist, so I always kind of go foods first. But I think there are some good fiber supplements that you can get out there. I don't have examples of them right here. But, yeah, there are some that, uh, that you can go to. And so I think that's a, you know, that's a way to get them. I'm not against supplementing if, you know, foods are just not doing it for you. But I always try to recommend Try to get in there and get it from foods first and see and see how you do. When you start increasing fiber, make sure that you increase your fluid intake because if not, it can actually constipate you because fiber needs to absorb that fluid to soften stools to then move through through your body. Some of the fibers do. There are different types of fibers. 
Yeah. About to curl up just a little bit more. There's a question about um, a couple we've missed. One about tips about eating out. Um, oh, yeah. So you're eating out. Are you talking about um, eating out from the perspective of eating healthily? Uh, or, you know, I'm not eating out yet. I'm waiting till <laughs> to live back. <laughs> I'm yeah. seeing too many people in these packed restaurants. But I think if you're talking about general health, eating out, I have been doing takeout. I, I, I do like to do takeouts. So if you're talking about it from a general health perspective, one of the first things I recommend with eating out is, um, you know, portion size. A lot of times just taking that, that meal that's pretty huge and, and getting two meals out of it is going to serve you well with making sure you're not overdoing, you know, just simply calories. My feelings about eating out, I love to eat out. I, I'm, I'm a foodie and I love food. Um, if, if you eat out a lot, then making healthful choices becomes more important if that's a big part of your life. So getting things like, uh, you know, ordering vegetables and salads and getting those, those healthier foods. If you eat out less frequently, is it as important to always make that healthy choice? Can you go and eat French fries? Now, French fries are one of my favorite foods. I don't get them that often. But, you know, when I go out, if the French fries are looking really good, yeah, I'm going to get them. Um, my, some of my favorite French fries in town uh, were these garlic fries that, that I, I just love. And what I would always do is this place that had them, I would always get the, the, the garlic parmesan fries, but then I would get a salmon salad. So I kind of felt like I was balancing out and getting my salad. I'm getting my, my salmon and then I'm having my fries on the side that I share with everybody. So I think it's really important to enjoy your food and find ways, uh, to do that. Um, where again, you're enjoying, enjoying foods sharing the higher fat, higher calorie foods, and then focusing on those healthy foods. I don't know if I answered your question. Is, uh, yeah, uh, I, think, I, I think you hit what she was, what she was yeah. getting at. I, I, I think for me, um, again, I'm a nutritionist, but I also really love food. And my mom is Italian American. So I grew up in a very food loving family. And so I tend to shy away from real extreme diets. Somebody was asking about the keto diet. And I think keto diet, you know, there's some data that if you've got diabetes and you really want to reverse your type 2 diabetes, for some people, the keto diet can be really, really helpful. It's a pretty strict diet. Now, if you want to control your diabetes through diet and not have to take medications, that might be a really good route to go to. And there are some people that really enjoy a keto diet. And so I think you have to look at it from you know, what's important to me in my life as far as my enjoyment of food, what kinds of foods I like, and then also my health goals. And I think the person who was asking about the keto diet was asking about it with, um, with fatty liver disease. And yeah, you know, the keto diet is very high in fat. And there have been some, uh, some groups of people where that's not really the probably the safest thing to go with because you can sort of overload that liver a, a little bit. You know, with fatty liver disease, there, you know, we generally recommend if you are carrying extra weight, weight loss is one of the most effective things you can do. And so that may be a place to start with. For any of you that have um, chronic diseases or, or, or specific conditions, talk to your doctor about getting a referral to a registered dietitian at Kirkland Clinic there are a bunch of registered dietitians that are there to help you. And um, a lot of times it's paid for, sometimes, I've not all the time, um, but, but insurance. But that's a really great place to go if you're having, if, if you have specific issues and they can help you uh, come up with a very um, effective, specific meal plan for you. The only other question I see here that we haven't touched on yet is the turmeric, if I'm pronouncing that correct. Yeah, yeah. Turmeric is a supplement that you see a lot of people recommending. Um, I, the studies are kind of um, 
inconclusive. It's one of those things that I think if you want to take it, it's probably not going to be harmful. It's one of those things where you, you know, we talked about the markers of inflammation where it may be beneficial for reducing those markers. Does it have an effect on disease outcome? That's the big question. I don't think it's particularly harmful to take it. This would be another great one. We're going to a website like Consumer Labs to look for specific supplements that have in it what they say they have in it. With the supplements, I really want to stress that the things we talked about today, these are the ones exercising to reduce inflammation, getting the fatty fish, the Mediterranean or DASH type style of plant diet. That should be your first approach because that's where we so far see the best data is this data slam dunk i wouldn't go that far but that's where we see the strongest data so that should be your foundation and then you can start with adding on various supplements like turmeric or other types of supplements that may play a role with the supplements again it's really important to look for quality supplements and to make sure that you realize that, you know, the data is here. A lot of the promises that you see are up here. So it gets a little ahead of that. My feeling is that if it's not dangerous and you're not breaking your budget on it, you know, why not try it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good questions, guys. Yeah, these were wonderful questions. Wonderful questions. Yeah, I, I just, I know we're close on time. Um, I, I do have a, a this ties back to we talked we're talking about cheese and and kind of yeah. how, how satisfying that kind of food can be so yeah one of my my new favorite quarantine snack is i've discovered these dried figs that sarah and i were chatting about they are so good and they're so high in fiber but i'm gonna tell you something they taste a lot better with some brie yeah <laughs> i love it yeah yeah, yeah. I've kind of started making that like I'll eat, you know, five or six figs, but then I'll, I'll cut a few little slices of three. So I don't know if I'm just completely negating the, the benefit. Yeah. Of it. You know, something like that, you're not negating it. You're still getting that fiber is still effective. Those nutrients are still effective. If, if it starts to make you gain weight, then I would be more concerned about it. But if you're enjoying that, you know, again, I'm a foodie. I kind of err on the side of, of enjoying your food. You know, it's interesting, um, Cindy, we've seen some research back when I started out. I've been doing this for about 30 years now. You know, we used to tell people whole milk, try not to drink whole milk, go down to 1% or skim. Um, some of the data now shows that whole milk probably isn't a risk for heart disease and the high fat dairy products. The other thing, and, and I've had some patients tell me this anecdotally. I had a patient who told me that she drinks milk, and I'm not a big milk drinker. I like my other dairy, but I'm not a big milk drinker. I'll, I'll, I'll put it on cereal. But she said that for her, when she would drink a cup of milk, it satisfied her. And when she drank a cup of milk in the afternoon, she found that she didn't crave other foods later on in the day. Yeah. Now, is that going to be true for everybody? That was her experience. And so I think things like that, you have to kind of look at your own experience with food. Um, for some people, they may overdo the brie. It may make them start to gain weight because they're throwing it on everything for you, Cindy. It may be, wow, I'm really enjoying this. This is pleasurable. It's helping me eat this, uh, these, these dried figs that I love that are really healthy for me. Uh, parents with kids, you know, uh, I've had parents that have said, well, the only way I can get my kid to eat carrot sticks is for them to dip them in ranch dressing. That's fine. They're getting all those healthy nutrients. Interestingly, when you eat a high beta carotene food like carrots, research has found that if you don't have it with a high fat food, it doesn't get absorbed as well. So sometimes these, these foods that we think about as not being healthy because they've got, say, some fat in them, they might actually be helping us absorb those healthy nutrients. So I always tell people when you have a salad, when you're getting, you know, particularly foods that have beta carotene in it, it needs fat for absorption. So adding olive oil, adding some salad dressing or some cheese or some nuts with some fat, it's actually helping you to absorb that healthy nutrient. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And so I think this goes back. I'm very big on sort of traditional food ways. 
I eat Mediterranean simply because that was my upbringing. I don't do it because it's healthy. I do it because that's how I was raised. That's what I like. I'm lucky that it happens to be a healthy way to eat as well. So we have to work within our, our traditional food ways a lot of times. Yeah. Well, I, I know we're I'm kind of trying to keep an eye on time. I hope we're not keeping you from something. No, but- I am fine. So if anybody has any more questions, I'm happy to stay a few minutes over. I'm also happy for people to um, email me. I didn't put where you can follow me, but for any of you who are on Facebook, we have a UAB Facebook site called UAB Nutrition Trends. Um, so UAB Nutrition Trends, I'm really bad at advertising. I should have had a slide up with all of that. So UAB Nutrition Trends, if you'd like to follow us there. I have a YouTube page. It's simply Best Kitchen, PhD, RDN. So if you put Best Kitchen, PhD, RDN in, you will, um, you will find uh, videos that I do. So please follow us there. I thought I saw somebody with the name Brie. I'm so jealous. How good is my name? Oh, I know. Isn't that great? I love Brie. I love their so fatty or cheeses. Um, you know, they're not as nutritious for you as like the hard cheeses that are higher in protein and calcium. But Cindy, I add those in too. I love, I love um, double or triple creme Brie cheese. So, you know, it's all about balancing it in. I really feel like, you know, those, I, I kind of like the whole, you guys might have heard of the 80-20. If 80% of what you're eating, 75, 80% is really healthy, and then the other, you know, 20, 25% is, you know, maybe marginal, you're, you're probably doing okay, right? right. So, right. Um, you know, I, I think of eating as being emotionally healthy as well, so I think that's important. Well, you don't want to torture yourself. You have um, to think of that. Yeah, you have to really think of your mental health. And, you know, there are certain things that I'm not willing to give up, you know. And so sure. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. Sure. Um, any advice on nutrition to improve skin and, uh, I guess, uh, hair loss, you know, I guess to prevent hair loss? So, with skin, I, are, I don't know if you're thinking wrinkles. I'm in my 50s, so I think about wrinkles a lot. <laughs> um, you know, there are some very good if you're thinking wrinkles and over overall skin health topical there are some topical products that actually have some really good data um tretinoin which is retin-a it is prescription but you can get it a prescription where your doctor would probably write you when it's, it's expensive but a little goes a long way and it's really good at it's not like a facelift in a tube by any means but there's really good data that over time people using this over, you know, when you start getting over six months, you can really see some pretty good differences helping with things like sun damage and things like that. There is also an over-the-counter product, over-the-counter products that contain niacinamide, and that's a derivative of vitamin D, niacinamide. Um, Oil of Olay has some products, um, and that has actually been studied and been shown to help with skin tone and again, not facelift in a, in a container, but helping with sort of fine lines and reducing wrinkles over time. So you got to give it some time. There have been some studies with some collagen supplements. Now, collagen is not one product. Collagen, there's a whole array of types of collagen. There's one, collagen one, two, three all different types of collagen types, and, and they help with different things. Some, of, some collagen supplements may help particularly with osteoarthritis. Others may help with things like wrinkles. Very modest, the studies show very modest effects, but that's something to try. And if you go on my YouTube page, one of my, um, I did a TV segment one morning on collagen supplements and what to look for. If you go on my YouTube page, you should find that there. If you don't find it, email me and I can send you the link to that. And I go through in that, in that video the different types of, of um, collagen supplements and what might help with what thing. So basically with skin, it's, you know, maybe collagen supplements are, are beneficial modestly, but, you know, if if you really want something that's been shown scientifically, I would go for those topical. Again, if you're talking wrinkles, tretinoin also helps. Tretinoin's the retin-A. 
if you have problems with acne and pimples, it really helps with that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, these things are not super cheap, but you know, uh, a little goes a long way and they can last you a long time. So there's a little sticker shock, but, but they can last quite a long time. Yeah. 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 For sure. These masks are making me break. Oh, yeah. I've, I have talked to a lot of people um, who um, you have to wear, particularly the N95 mask, nurses, doctors, other healthcare workers, all the support staff that are, you know, those frontline folks that are out there. And, yeah, I've seen, you know, a lot of people that have breaking out problems, and it's, it's, um, it's pretty bad. Yeah, that's, that's a problem. Is there anything you can recommend um, in dietary wise to help with um, hormonal stuff? I think I think we're all women on here now. Yeah. So. <laughs> Are we all postmenopausal women now? Yeah. Um, there have been, a, you know, depending on the symptoms of um, of menopause that you are experiencing. You know, if you're having hot flashes, there's nothing that matches estrogen for getting rid of hot flashes. Now there are a lot of issues with estrogen. If you have a personal history of breast cancer, a family history of breast cancer, it may not be the right choice for you. But many gynecologists these days um, are recommending super low dose estrogen in the patch form, which seems to be safer from the perspective of, of stroke risk. So I would talk to your gynecologist if you're having severe hot flashes, uh, there are a lot of studies that show that, you know, it may be probably safe for those early years, early postmenopausal. It's really long term where you want to kind of be careful not to uh, use the estrogen. As far as supplements are concerned, the data is somewhat disappointing when you look at estrogen supplements, soy supplements. There, um, there is a soy supplement, and if you're talking hot flashes and bone loss, there is a soy supplement called Foxium. It's a supplement, but you have to have a prescription for it. It's, it, it, it's in this weird category called a medical food, and it actually has good data on it. And it's, it's soy, but a lot of the soy supplements out there the formulations have not been studied, and they are a combination of two soy estrogens, genistein and desine. Only the genistein seems to be effective in reducing hot flashes and helping with bone health. So this, this supplement called Fostium is um, simply the genistein. And some of my doctors actually do prescribe it in our clinic for women with not too bad osteoporosis because there's some modest bone benefits from it. So my doctors actually do sometimes prescribe it if somebody's not super high risk for fracture. And it does have data that shows that it reduces hot flashes. There may be other supplements out there, but the data are so mixed. And um, you'll see a lot of promises out there. And... Um, so that is a very much a proceed with caution. I, I, I do have some concerns about soy supplements because they are a form of estrogen. And so it's really important that you talk to your physician about that because some of them could actually increase the risk of, um, of breast cancer. I see that with the bioidentical estrogens that really get pushed. They say they have data that they're not going to increase breast cancer, and that is not true. So you've got to be really careful with a lot of the bioidentical estrogens. The soy supplements can possibly be beneficial. Um, black cohosh, some data supports that, you, but there, it's really unclear. And, and so that, that's a whole talk in and of itself. If you guys want to do a talk on that down the road, I would love to, to – really dive into that data and we can and we can talk about that great gotta give yeah, you a couple I, of months stuff. <laughs> yeah i think everybody's had we've had some really good good uh comments here in the thread and and i really appreciate everybody uh feeling comfortable jumping in with your questions you know we're yeah. all we're all in this together so yeah 
Thank I you would for- love to, like I said, down the road, if you want to do like a, like an aging postmenopausal, cause that's, I'm there. You know, I've worked in the osteoporosis clinic since I was in my thirties. And so it's always that aging and, and um, osteoporosis have always been passions of mine. But man, once I hit my fifties, it became really personal. Yeah. <laughs> so now um, I'm really passionate about it. So. I, I would love that, and I think uh, a lot of a lot of the the ladies on this chat are a good bit younger, but um, but it's even still so, one, it's still something of interest because you want to be prepared. It is. I mean, that's that's exactly right. So I'll I'll we'll keep that in mind. I, I, yeah. I, I we would love to have you back. So, but I, I am going to let you get on with your day now. I know Sarah, <laughs> folks have to jump off to wrangle. Yeah, I see things. people saying they've got other stuff to do. Everybody's busy, so uh, I really enjoyed this, Cindy. So thank you so much. Oh, thank, thank you so much. And um, we, we appreciate it. And um, we look forward to doing it again. Thanks a lot, Cindy. Nice to meet you all.